So my name is Courtney Sharp. And my name is Karen Michelle. And, and welcome to the Black and Design <laughs> Conference. <laughs> Um, so we think it's particularly important, not only because of the events in Ferguson and Baltimore that made national news last year, but because these events are unfortunately not uncommon. Um, we felt that it was imperative to make a new contribution to this conversation and to use our training as designers to convene a conversation about how to intervene in these cycles of injustice. We are particularly grateful to everyone who organized, protested, and acted to raise consciousness to bring the conversation about social injustice today to the forefront of, forefront of a national discourse. So here at the GSD, the African American Student Union participated in marches in Boston. We went to vigils that were hosted um, around Harvard. And we also uh, had a project, Map the Gap, a mapping project, which you can see out uh, by the elevators on the first floor. And we really wanted to, ooh, <laughs> we created the installation to honor the lives that were lost to police brutality, and we thought it was really important that we make a memorial to that. Uh, we would like to thank the administration for, for providing financial support to make that project a reality, as well as an installation we had that uh, commemorated the lives that were lost between um, the passing of Michael, Gr uh, Michael Brown and Freddie Gray. And we also would like to thank them for their support in making this a reality, mm -hmm. without in which it would not have been possible. In so. particular, we'd like to thank the Public Programs Office and Chantel Blakely, who worked tirelessly to help sure, make, uh, make sure that this logistically went very smoothly. Yes. So thank you to Chantel. Um, so, uh, Dean Mohsen Mostafavi, during his tenureship here, established a committee to address diversity issues within the school that has contributed to making this institution a more inclusive space, and we would like him to come up and introduce this conference. But, bef but before he begins, yes. <laughs> I'm going to read his bio to you. <laughs> I feel we must, we must. We'll give you your due credit. <laughs> So, Dean Mosavavi is an architect and educator, and he's the, our dean here. Um, he was formerly the dean of the College of Architecture and Planning at Cornell University, and uh, he has taught n at numerous institutions, including University of Pennsylvania, University of Cambridge, and Frankfurt Academy of Fine Arts. Um, he serves on the steering committee of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, and has served on the design committee of the London Department, uh, sorry, the London Development Agency and the Reba Gold Medal. Uh, he is a consultant on a number of international uh, architecture and urban projects. So thank you so much for your contributions to the design thank field. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. So that was a little bit of an old CV. I don't really do any of those things anymore, but, but it's okay. Um, um, I just wanted to tell you how happy I am that you're all here, that this event is happening, that tomorrow is going to be happening. And I really want to, uh, for us to take a minute to thank the committee co-chairs, the committee members. This is Kara Mitchell that you just uh, met, Courtney Sharp, Azura Cox, Blair Story Johnson, Dana McKinney, Francisco Lara Garcia, Catherine Coriel, Megan Eccles, and Shani Carter for making this possible. I also want to take this opportunity to thank a few members of the old ASU, other friends of the school, Seko Cook, who's here. We had the pleasure of seeing him in Chicago recently, Sarah Zwedi, Hector Torres Picard, uh, Ethan Lasseter, Eric Shaw, who's I think the fourth GSD graduate director of planning in DC, Omar Davis, and many others who are here um, this afternoon. I think what is so wonderful and exciting about this event is that not only the topic that it's dealing with, but also many of the people that it's bringing together. And I'm so, um, so honored and so pleased that if you look at our brochure, that you know, such a large proportion of these people who will be speaking to us today and tomorrow are actually connected uh, with the with the GSD. 
We have, of course, uh, among us uh, David Lee, uh, who has taught here for many years in the past, Stephen Gray, who has just joined us at the GSD as a new assistant professor of urban design, Liz Ogbu, a graduate of the school, Tim and Antaran Evans, uh, Michael Pride is a graduate of the school, Sarah I already mentioned, uh, Nat Belcher, uh, who is uh, now the chair and professor at Penn State, uh, William Williams, and many, many, many other people, um, and as I said, other speakers, um, Setu, Brent Legs, Phil Freelon, and so the list goes on. So I'm mentioning those names specifically because I think it's really important to recognize the enormous contribution that people um, have uh, made. I see Tony Griffin here in front of me. I'm mean, so many people who've really made significant impact uh, towards the built environment, towards the kinds of issues that will be discussed. And I think that that for me is also a celebration of their contribution, of their commitment, of the fantastic work uh, that they have, uh, they have done. It's a kind of interesting moment for me personally because um, I just remembered that it was exactly 20 years ago that I helped organize a conference in this room called Denaturalized Urbanity, Race, Gender, and Ethnicity in the Landscape of the American City. And the purpose of that conference exactly 20 years ago, 1994, 1995, was to examine the relationship between race and space, questions of gender, the role of ethnicity. So for example, we dealt with the way in which a synagogue uh, was um, turned into a Korean temple and the relationship between the, the iconology of the synagogue and its erasure in order to become a, a Korean temple, that this is like a spatial project that deals with questions of, of ethnicity. Uh, we had a fantastic presentation um, about race and space that was actually about the, the movie, The Lion King, and the connection of The Lion King to the degradation, if you like, of uh, the American city and how the movie industry was really um, using entertainment to um, reinforce certain ideological constructs and what, what was the connection between the movie industry and its kind of affirmations and the landscape of the American city. And, you know, yesterday we had a group of our visiting committee go to um, see the work that some of the students are doing with Professor Dan Deoka um, upstairs. Um, on the uh, Martin Luther King boulevards, which is something that he will also touch on. My point is that on one level, nothing has changed, that there's 20 years since then, and the issues remain really absolutely pertinent, and that the, the, the relationship between um, race and space, the way in which uh, one could say that the racialization of space is becoming even more extreme, uh, is, is continuing. And so I think it's fantastic that uh, this group of students and, and alumni have come together with the support of so many other people, so many of you uh, from other institutions to really help us think through uh, these really critical questions today, but at the same time to really open up new possibilities to help celebrate all the work that, that you're doing. I think you know, the organizers reminded me that it's important that this is not only something that is focusing on the, on the difficulties, but it's also important to recognize the positive aspect and really the celebration and the commitment of, of all, the, all the great energy that you have and all the fantastic work that you, that you do. I think in the school, it is uh, true that over the last uh, let's say seven or eight years, we've tried to have with the support of a large group of students, faculty um, uh, and staff, a systematic kind of re-examination of the way that we operate as an institution, how we can really be a more uh, diverse institution and how the question of diversity is a fundamental 
issue, fundamental um, aspect of our creative endeavor. In other words, we do not see uh, diversity as a kind of problem-solving thing. We see diversity as an opportunity, which really is critical in terms of how we think about our cities, how we think about the way in which, in our field, we think about scenario planning of the kind of um, sets of relationships, sets of connections that can happen. And I think that that's a really significant part of, of what we are about. I think we've had some success. We obviously need to do a lot more, especially, I think, from the perspective of the students when it comes to uh, the way in which our curriculum is, is, is being tuned to respond to some of these issues that are so pertinent and, and so, so critical today. And I think we will be really focusing on that. So we're really um, optimistic about uh, today and tomorrow and hope um, and know that uh, we will learn a great deal uh, from all of you. And we're really excited um, and grateful to all the organizers for, for making this possible. And I, I for one, uh, am looking forward to uh, an incredible day and a half or whatever is left of, uh, of this event. So thank you again for very, very much for being here. And let's sort of really celebrate and uh, move on with and move forward with this really important project. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Michael Hayes, the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, and I'm really honored to have been invited to moderate the, this, the panel for tonight. But you're probably wondering why all these white guys are introducing black and design. Um, so I'll, I'll, try, I'll, try to, I'll try to explain. And of course, <laughs> um, I'm going to, of course, quote, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I'm, I'm going to keep, I'm not going to edit the racial and gendered uh, language that he uses at the 1960s. To find the origins of the Negro problem, we must turn to the white man's problem. Now, I think, I think what Dr. King may have meant by the white man's problem is what I want to call the white spatial imaginary. And this is the problem. In the white spatial imaginary, whites are not represented to themselves as white. We, we are variously, we can be from different classes, uh, we, we are gendered, we might be differently abled uh, and differently sexualized. Uh, we might even recognize racial minorities, but in the white imaginary, white is not a race. So this spatial imaginary has prevented, it has certain consequences that are, that are central to design. It's prevented some of us from understanding fundamental features of the social spaces in which we live. The white spatial imaginary has produced the neighborhoods, the workplaces, the schools, where white people, some know very little about black people, which in turn produces the kind of defensive localism uh, that dominates decisions about public interventions uh, and, and how services are distributed. And of course, it produces that privatism, which sometimes turns hostile. The, the, the radicalized place that black Americans live in have compelled them to develop a different optics. George Lipsitz from UC Santa Barbara stresses this, this and, and says that black people have had to, out of necessity, turn segregation into congregation. And this has produced a very different kind of spatial imaginary that counters this privatism and, and localism. So what I want to suggest, and, and, and remember that this first panel is, is about issues of pedagogy, and we were charged by the organizers to speak to how pedagogy uh, can address uh, issues of uh, social injustice. And I want to suggest that the sp this idea of a spatial imaginary helps us get to pedagogy. I want to borrow um, uh, from the French philosopher uh, uh, Jacques Rancière, who talks about the distribution of the sensible. 
Now, sensible just refers to what can be apprehended by the senses. It's very, very central to design and even to art. Um, the distribution of the sensible, uh, it, it makes aesthetics central to politics. And this distribution is just a, a framework, the physical spatial framework that ultimately produces that spatial imaginary, that determines, Rancière says, what is even possible to see or not see, what is possible to hear or not hear, what is even possible to say or even to think, to do, to make. Now, there's no political party involved here. There are no police force in, in Hummers. What's important is that which is possible to apprehend by the senses literally determines the condition of possibility for perception, thought, action. It determines the spatial imaginary. So I, what I want to submit, if we can think about teaching, if, if we can take, we can teach the techniques, the practices, uh, the forms of design that distribute space, time, that distribute subjects and objects with this in mind, um, then we can have uh, pedagogically can have very real effect on place-related uh, opportunities. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I was, I, w I, w I was done, I was gonna go, but I have to introduce the panel. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna introduce the, the, the panel in the order that they will speak. It's also listed in the order that they will speak um, in, in, the, in your program. And I'm gonna make very short introductions because the, the whole CV is, uh, the, the bio is, is here. Uh, Amber Wiley will be our first speaker. She's assistant professor of American studies at Skidmore College. Um, just, just having a, a, a piece in a book uh, coming out this, is it out yet? Just, just about out called Walking in Cities, Quotidian Mobility as Urban Theory, Method, and Practice. There are a number of other publications she's uh, involved with about designing schools and about space, place, and, and pedagogy. That's also forthcoming. Uh, after Amber will be Dan Dioka. He's an urban planner, and as Mosin said, he's teaching an option studio this semester at GSD. He's principal and co-founder of the New York-based uh, architecture planning and research firm called Interboro and Partners, and he'll be, um, he'll be talking about some of the I think some of the work of Interboro. Um, Diane Davis is our chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design, and Charles uh, Norton, professor of regional planning and urbanism at the GSD. And she's she's published widely. I won't uh, I won't list them here, but just to say that her current work um, often involves uh, issues of, of violence and spatial. Um, defense in, in Mexico, but also, and I think you'll talk about the St. Louis project, the, the, the turn to American cities. And then also uh, a professor of landscape architecture, associate professor of landscape architecture at GSD, Sonia Dumpelman, will follow Diane. Sonia has just, um, just had a, a publication of, of a book out called Flights of Imagination, Aviation, Landscape, and Design, um, and also has recently co-edited Women, Modernity, and Landscape Architecture. And then finally, Tony Griffin, who's also mentioned. Tony is right now professor of architecture and, and, and also the founding director of the Max Bond Center on Design at City College in, in, in New York. Uh, is published widely um, uh, and, 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 and is dedicated uh, to teaching on issues of advancement of education, research, and advocacy uh, in, in, in ways that uh, make communities sustainable. So Amber, if you'll start us off. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Amber Wiley. I am from Skidmore. I just started that position, though. I previously was teaching at Tulane in the School of Architecture um, from 2011 until 2014, and then I just spent the last academic year traveling on the Society of Architectural Historians, H. Allen Brooks Traveling Fellowship. I went to six countries, uh, Mexico, Guatemala, Ghana, Ethiopia, India, and Vietnam. Uh, studying architectural history, looking at sites firsthand, um, really trying to figure out um, 
or get a firsthand experience of the non-Western tradition of architecture. Um, but as I told some folks earlier today, every country that I went to had been colonized in any event. So then I was still looking at Spanish colonial as well, in addition to Mayan um, and Aztec architecture, or looking at British colonial and uh, Dutch and Danish influences in Ghana. The Italians were in Ethiopia and did some things as well. Uh, the British in India, as well as the French in Vietnam. So it was it was trying to look at the indigenous histories of architecture, but also understanding the colonial aspects and how those are interpreted and reinterpreted in public history as well as preservation projects. Now, uh, my job at Skidmore, I'm in the American Studies Department, so I'm teaching two courses, one called the American City and the other is called African American Experience. And I'm trying to take some of that architectural and spatial uh, background and knowledge into informing how those classes get taught. Before I talk a bit about Skidmore, though, I would like to talk about uh, the time that I spent at Tulane. Uh, and I was teaching required courses at Tulane, two of the required history courses um, for sophomores or second years. In this particular case, it was a five-year program. And I tried to make the history class more engaging, a little bit more fun, uh, thinking about architecture in any number of ways, very basic, simple ways. Architecture is nature. Architecture is afterlife. Uh, architecture is ritual. Uh, trying to move away from the dates and facts approach that many of our students uh, felt that the history class, what it was, that that's what it was about. I'm not even really good with dates myself, so. I understand. Now, uh, you know, it, it, it was put upon me to teach the course in, in a way that I actually wasn't wholly prepared for because I was told that I had to teach the global history of architecture. <laughs> and even when I graduated from undergrad and got my master's, it was really about the Western history of architecture. And I said, okay, so I'm going to learn about Indian Buddhist shrines. I know nothing about India or nothing about Buddhism, but I can talk about it uh, once I read about it. And so that's part of what that trip was, is to really gain an understanding of this non-Western tradition of architecture. But of course, as life would have it, I ended up in an architecture, American Studies program after that. So um, one of the reasons why we were really pushing for this global history of architecture is because of NAB. Now, uh, I was only three years into my job at Tulane when I uh, had to deal with NAB accreditation, and Maurice is in the audience, he was there with me, he understands. Um, and we had, as faculty, to look at student performance criteria. Uh, what were these students learning? These are the things that the National Architecture Accredi Accrediting Board wants the students to learn, and they have to produce, or we have to produce uh, folders that show that they have the ability through student work um, to, to hit these key points that NAB wanted, um, or they had an understanding. And, and so we had to spend a lot of time thinking about these different realms of learning. Realm A, and this is 2009, they've updated it since 2013, 2014, um, critical thinking and representation, integrated building practices, technical skills and knowledge, and leadership and practice. I think they renamed it to professional practice. So I, um, I had a steep learning curve in the first three years of teaching there and trying to understand what it is that the professional accrediting board wanted our students to know. Um, what was critical to my courses, the history courses, the required courses I taught, I found that two realms in particular were useful to think about. Um, and this is not going to be a NAB workshop, so I'm going to skip a couple slides because y'all need to know all the details. Um, but uh, if we go down to the bottom of this one, theoretical, social, political, economic, cultural, and environmental context, that means we expect our students to be able to work in a whole load of different contexts. And I was like, okay, this is good because that's what we do that in my class. Cool. Um, and that's what I'm going to skip this one histories of global. Um, tradition and culture, and, and move to another one, cultural diversity. This is one of the things that we had to say our students knew about. This is required by the Architecture Accreditation Board. Students should show an understanding of the diverse needs, values, and behavioral norms. This is very long. Um, social and spatial patterns that characterize cultures and individuals 
and the implication of diversity on the societal roles and responsibilities of architects. They say it. They want us to do it. Um, and I was like, yes, yes. So this right here is fodder. If you ever get the argument that, you know, it's not really important, that's not what we're about in design school. Oh, no, no, no. NAP says that's what we're about. We have to do this. Okay. Um, another one, and this has been renamed in Rome C, Leadership and Practice. Uh, they talk about managing, advocating, acting legally, ethically, and critically for the good of the client, society, and the public. This includes collaboration, business, and leadership skills. Again, if you ever get any pushback about what architecture is or what our role is as designers, or in my case, historian, say, no, no. Our accreditation board says that our students should be able to advocate and act legally and ethically and think critically about the impact of design on society. Yep, it's in there. I spent a lot of time with this material, so I know. Um, and finally, I'm skipping those two. It, it brings us to the idea, you know, we, and I do know that we get pushback. So if you want to engage, say, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, as designers, as historians, as urban planners, and people say, what does Black Lives Matter have to do with design or urban planning? You can just say, well, NAB accreditation says, <laughs> and then go from there. Um, so I was part of a, a project uh, Digital Humanities Project, uh, the aggregate website, uh, where a number of different historians, preservationists, planners, um, were asked to, to talk about the issue of Black Lives Matter. Uh, and it was a really powerful portfolio, um, and it was really heartening, in a sense. This came out, I think, in the spring of this year, because people really wanted to talk about these things and, and give some sort of voice to the struggle. I'm going to talk a bit about two classes that I taught that had no effect whatsoever on our NAB accreditation, accreditation and that's uh, two electives, upper level seminars that I taught. Um, one was called Sights and Sounds Public History. In New Orleans, everything is touched by music. And so I wanted my students to be able to talk about historic narratives of New Orleans, the musical landscape, the parks, the pubs, uh, the warehouses turned into clubs, all of these things, and give um, some sort of building history about it, and also to engage in the digital humanities. So what we were able to do is take a digital humanities program platform that was being produced in the communications department at Tulane and engage it with our own architectural history and building history work uh, and think about the way the music and the built environment uh, overlapped in these ways. And so I'm going to skip that part. I had students who were able to meet students from other um, departments outside of the School of Architecture because they were engaged in this much larger project within Tulane. I'm so happy that I have this dewdrop in slide. So they used the platform to um, produce histories of particular sites throughout New Orleans that have the history of music embedded within them. Maurice Cox actually did a Tulane City Center uh, project with the Dewdrop in, but I had individual students doing research on it. Um, and there was a stronger impetus for them to do the work right because it was public and someone would have to read it. And that made them work harder and think harder about the things that they were doing. Um, so there were social histories mixed in with the architectural histories, histories of space. I had graduate students who were my research assistants who helped me with my own research uh, as it related to music and the urban landscape. And, and the, the research was actually picked up by the City Lab um, just recently as people were looking at the um, anniversary of Katrina. Finally, we also had a public history uh, program dedicated to some of the findings that the students made doing their research. We in, 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 um, engaged the National Park Service in this conversation, and we actually had people who were uh, involved with these various sites that we researched talking about what the site was before Katrina, how it changed after Katrina, and some of the struggles that they were dealing with now. 
five minutes. Uh, and so it was really wonderful because we were A, able to produce public history, and B, I was able to engage graduate research assistants with it, and C, include the public in this larger discussion. And it was really uh, uh, kind of invigorating for me, and it was great for the students as well. We also had music. Finally, uh, to talk about my second class, um, elective course, I stole this name from, a school, uh, from Cornell. I was looking, when I was looking to do elective courses, I was trying to think of different topics I wanted to talk about, so I was looking at different schools of design and seeing what their classes were and if it made any sense to, and I, so I took the architecture, culture, and society. I don't know what that class at Cornell is about, but I know what my class is about. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of text here that I'm just gonna skip through. Um, but I want to talk about some of the underlying theory. I was able to give voice to some theory to talk about the relationship of architecture to culture and culture to society through my American Studies training. Michael came up here and he quoted a, a reverend slash political activist. He quoted an American Studies scholar. And he quoted a philosopher. Um, and so in this course here, we looked at philosophers' interpretations of the built environment, scholars who looked at capital, capitalist society, and, and, and also uh, the social production of space. And we used this theory to give my students a means of talking about the built environment in ways that they might not have talked about it before. Also, granted, um, a, a benefit of my American studies background is that I was able to use film, music, poetry, novels, and art I said, these people who produce these films, who produce this music, who talk, you know, produce this poetry, they're talking about the built environment too, and we should see them as, as people that uh, are informing our understanding of the built environment. So fast forward, I did different themes. One theme uh, was housing projects. We looked at Raymond, Raymond Williams' definition of community, what it means to be a community. Uh, we read the scholarship of Arnold Hirsch in Making the Second Ghetto in Public Housing in, in Chicago. Uh, we talked about the Mecca Flats and its relationship to the construction of the IIT campus, but we also heard from Gwendolyn Brooks because she could tell us about everyday life in the Mecca Flats. Um, we looked at the major figures in design, and we looked at the people whose voices hadn't been heard, people who were um, uh, struggling not to have their homes demolished for the expansion of the IIT campus. You rarely hear their stories, um, but we heard about them in the class. We looked at the key legis legislation that informed uh, the shapes of the housing, um, how legislation informs scale, how it informs um, distribution of housing throughout the city. And finally, we looked at reinterpretations, artistic reinterpretations. Carrie James Marshall, one of my favorite artists, um, and how he came to understand the spaces. So it wasn't, it wasn't just about the buildings themselves. We, we talked about the issues of what community is. We talked about um, how legislation affects these things. We talked about the theory behind capitalism and how it moves and shapes the way our built environment works. Um, and also about how artists are, are, are informants in some of the results. Uh, so issues to talk about or think about, issues in the academy. Um, the public, the digital, uh, public Digital Humanities Project was great. It reached a lot of different um, areas. But there's, unfortunately, a devaluation and distrust of digital humanities. Um, the print word still rules, and books still reign supreme. So even though all that work was put into the uh, elective course, it matters for not. If you're a young scholar, maybe on the tenure track, and you say, hey, I did this public history project. That's great, but is it an article? Is it a book? No. And so that's kind of discouraged. It's discouraging, in a sense, when you want to have these kinds of discussions and, and engagements with your students. Um, and also, uh, what I also realize is that um, for the elective courses, they weren't considered central to my students' understanding, and they didn't even contribute to NAB accreditation. Uh, they were fluffed to the real work of the architectural uh, education. Uh, but we can make the argument um, that you know these kinds of courses are necessary, and in fact, the NAB requires them. Uh, and so, whenever you're put up against a wall in that kind of way, well, say no, no, no. NAB wants it. Finally, 
I just want to invite you, this is a plug, it's shameless. The Vernacular Architecture Forum on the board. We have a conference coming up in June in Durham, North Carolina, from factory to, uh, farm to factory, Piedmont stories in black and white. Architectural historians talking about the racial landscape. Please come. We need more architects in our midst. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, so thanks for the invitation to speak at this uh, amazing, awesome conference. Uh, I'm so thrilled that it's happening. I feel like we should give another round of applause to the organizers. This is just so exciting. Um, the format's amazing. The round, round tables, it's great. Uh, so, and I want to say I'm also really happy I've been asked to uh, talk about pedagogy, which coincidentally enough is one of my favorite things to uh, talk about. Uh, my simple message is, let's give students more opportunities to address race, place, power, and privilege. Please. Uh, pretty please. Uh, in my experience, race generally is something that a lot of students have to be asked to ask questions about. But in my experience, when students are encouraged to explore what design can do to undo the effects of forced segregation, they knock it out of the park. Uh, so let's give them a chance. There's a lot at stake here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few projects that students of mine have done. Um, now, before I started teaching here at the GSD, I taught at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, MICA. My students there were architects, sculptors, photographers. Um, they were overwhelmingly white. Uh, Micah is in a neighborhood, Bolton Hill, uh, which is white too. Interestingly, Bolton Hill is surrounded on all sides by neighborhoods that are overwhelmingly black. So you may have seen these uh, judgmental maps. This is one of Baltimore. Uh, so there's Micah indicated by art nerds. Uh, so zooming in, we see it's surrounded by nothing but trouble, drugs and prostitutes, and the wire. I didn't make this map. Uh, so here's a typical block in art nerds. Here's one in nothing but trouble. Here's one in the wire. Um, the first class I ever taught at Micah in 2005 was a survey class that looked at the policies, uh, plans, and practices that have shaped cities in the United States. Uh, since this class focused on race, uh, I thought we should start by thinking about Bolton Hill. Why was it so white compared to the neighborhoods around it? Why was it so wealthy compared to the neighborhoods around it? Why were life expectancies so much higher? Actually, a 20-year life expectancy difference between this neighborhood and some of the surrounding ones. And why were the streets so relatively well-maintained? These are pretty basic questions, and by now we have some pretty basic answers to them. Uh, we know that racial segregation was the product of dozens of local, state, federal policies aimed explicitly sometimes at creating two Americas, separate and unequal. We have racial zoning. We have redlining. We have highway construction, white man's roads through black man's homes, urban renewal, which James Baldwin famously called uh, Negro removal, uh, suburban incorporation, which formed a white suburban noose around uh, our cities, um, racial covenants that defined who could and could not live in a house, uh, racist code of ethics that brokers swore to uphold, uh, and racial violence that confronted uh, individual, individuals who dared cross the color lines. So it was not difficult to, to tell a story about why these neighborhoods uh, outside of the Micah bubble were so different. And this is what we talked about in class. Interestingly, interestingly though, I found that the students had to be taught to ask these questions about why these neighborhoods were so different. Um, I think one reason had to do with the fact that this, this class is the first class they ever took in which they were asked to ask these questions uh, about the causes and the consequences of segregation. I'd like to think that the, the uprisings in New York, Ferguson, and Baltimore have helped put segregation back on the agenda. Uh, let's hope that this conference uh, marks the beginning of a renewed interest in race here at the GSD where it's clearly not talked about enough. Uh, in fact, just to take a step back, I think we don't generally talk about socio-political issues enough, period. I think many of us in the design field make the mistake of separating something off uh, and marginalizing, I would argue, something called social design, um, as if not all design was social, as if our choices about what to build for whom and where and in what style weren't political decisions. Of course, they are. You can't be apolitical in this business. So let's embrace this fact. Let's train designers and planners to be politically literate, literate to scrutinize and question everything. 
Um, when it comes to race, more specifically, it's important to remember that designers and planners from previous generations helped us get into the mess we're in, uh, and uh, we desperately need, I would argue, the best and brightest, that's you guys, uh, to, uh, to, to help us out of this mess. Uh, so the first project I want to talk about is this project called Baltimore Open City, and I'm just going to talk about it quickly because I didn't do it here. I want to focus on the projects I'm doing here. Uh, but uh, in 2011, um, uh, in my, my last year teaching at Mike, I worked with 28 students um, over the course of a year to mount a public exhibition about segregation called Baltimore Open City. Here's the cover of our book. Here's some spreads from the book we, we made. Uh, interestingly, it actually started as a seminar, just a bunch of us sitting together reading books about race. Uh, and, uh, but we wanted to do more, so to make a long story short, we found this cool old abandoned market space, we raised some money, we fixed it up, and we had an entirely student-produced, student-curated exhibition. These were undergrads. Uh, so um, here's our entryway, where you see the clever logo that the students came up with. Uh, adjacent to this is our curatorial statements, which led, led with the statement, cities exist to bring people together, but cities can also keep people apart. And then went on to explain that Baltimore has historically been a, something of a pioneer in the keeping people apart business. Uh, so this is something we explored. You see also here our calendar. We had lots of events in the space, starting with our opening party, where we invited a local marching band to parade through the space. It was really loud. Uh, we also used a, a space to raise money for local progressive nonprofits. Um, we had historians lead tours of historic sites of segregation in the city. Um, the work itself was really varied. Um, this was all student work, undergraduate work. So some students did a timeline of segregation in Baltimore. We had this, this uh, a map that introduced visitors to contemporary NIMBY battles being fought across the city. Uh, one student did these portraits of people who fought for integration uh, in Baltimore. Again, student work, undergraduate student work. Uh, they, so you know, we also uh, use the space to encourage people to be activists. So, uh, for example, by helping us build this house out of uh, We Buy Houses signs, these predatory signs. So we asked people to remove them from poles and sort of help us build this house. We asked people to come and uh, help us get involved with, um, with local uh, uh, nonprofits who are combating segregation in the city. There's a strong public component, so uh, one student made these amazing murals of planners uh, on the infrastructure that they planned, uh, along with some incri incriminating quotes about why they planned it. Uh, so here's an ad for the show. Uh, we, we, we pasted these posters around the city. Each one was site-specific. So this one was on Fulton Avenue, which represented the color line until it was uh, busted by blockbusters in the 60s. Uh, so we had about a half a dozen of these. Again, some spreads from our book. We invited local historians and activists to, to con contribute to it. Uh, and I'm showing this project, you know, it reflects my overall theme. So I mentioned earlier that you know, most of the students who took my classes had to be asked to ask questions about segregation. But what you see here is what students can do, even undergraduates, when given the chance to ask these questions. Um, OK, that's nice. But this is design school. Uh, we didn't come to the GSD to make exhibitions. We came here to get stuff done, GSD. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, spend my remaining time. Uh, <laughs> Talk, talk, showing a project that came out of a studio I taught in 2014. The studio was called The Storm, the Strife, and Everyday Life, See Changes in the Suburbs. And it invited students to work with uh, nonprofit and community-based partners to update Long Island's built environment for today's demographic realities. So here we are on our field trip uh, where we talked to people for whom Long Island was not working well. Long Island built primarily for wealthy, white, car-driving, nuclear families. Uh, but that's not the, increasingly the, the demographic profile of Long Island and a lot of other suburbs. So one person we talked to on the trip was uh, Elaine Gross. She's the executive director of this great group called uh, Erase Racism, um, Long Island-based group. And she made a pitch to the students. It was a tough one. But can you come up with ideas for building affordable housing in predominantly high-opportunity white communities that, because of nimbyism, uh, don't provide their fair share of affordable housing? Uh, Marcus Pulsifer, who is a MOD student, he, uh, he took the bait and he did a totally extraordinary project called the Schoolhouse Project. And its solution is to take vacant school properties uh, that are located in these white uh, high opportunity areas and convert them into mixed income suburban centers. 
So working with Elaine and also a civil rights attorney, he identified a school to serve as a, a prototype for this experiment. Um, his proposed design of the school and the grounds was amazing, but the project didn't stop there. He spent a lot of time thinking about implementation and ended up creating four brochures and four presentations that made a case from left to right down below for the ethical importance, the legal necessity, the financial feasibility, and the attractiveness of this project. So each brochure was created from the perspective of a different actor and was aimed at a different audience. So the graphics are all really different. So let's take a look quickly. Uh, so the first presentation was from a race racism to HUD. So Marcus did some role playing here, which isn't gonna translate as I represent this project. Uh, but this is a, pro a presentation to HUD to get them to support this idea. So it starts by looking at, so this is the brochure, starts by looking at segregation on Long Island, which you see is, it's a terrible problem. Uh, here's a part uh, where Marcus would say, is this the product of you know, preference? Of course not, all the studies done show that people wanna generally live in, mix, in mixed uh, race communities. So here's where he would go into what caused segregation on Long Island, no time for that now. What are the consequences? So educational disparities would be one uh, consequence. Uh, the blue numbers here uh, are scores that are granted to uh, schools on Long Island. The dots are African Americans, the background, uh, is income, and so what you see is that the schools with the most African Americans are the poorest, uh, and these get the lowest test scores. They're given the least amount of money. They have the lowest amount of resources. On the right, you see an incredible contrast between two board bordering towns, Garden City and Hempstead. Uh, so, how are we gonna break through this wall? We're gonna use schools. Um, there are a lot of schools. There are a lot of abandoned schools on Long Island. And they're great because they're connected to their neighborhoods. They're totally adaptable into all kinds of things. Uh, so now he's gonna ask, you know, what school? Uh, so he went through a number of indicators, which I'll take you through really fast. You know, you want a housing to be in a good school district. You want a, the, the housing to be in an area with a low crime rate. You want it close to transportation. You want it in a low poverty area. Uh, you want it to be safe from flooding, right? Low poverty, safe from flooding. Uh, so you overlay all of these, and to make a long story short, he landed on this shuttered school in Smithtown, Long Island. By the way, another factor here was, uh, where could this actually happen? So he was working with a civil rights attorney to determine this, and this is still an active case, which is really exciting. Uh, so here you see some of the good things about Smithtown. Uh, all right, so now we've made the case to HUD, put on another hat. So here Marcus has to make the pitch to investors. Uh, so we switched to a very different presentation, complete with clip art. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I don't want to go into details except uh, to say that he did a, a really good uh, discounted cash flow analysis. He, he really worked with Long Island to identify funding opportunities. He ran the numbers and looked at the IRR, given a different, different funding opportunities. The next presentation was that to Smithtown, and this was HUD to Smithtown, Smithtown saying, you're in trouble, this is the stick, not the carrot, right? Comply or else. So he made this brochure and this presentation about how uh, fair housing is a matter of law. So he, looked, he did a review of uh, fair housing policies. Point is, you can't try to keep people from moving into your town. He looked at Long Island projects, uh, fair housing rules. The tide of exclusion is changing. Uh, he looked at recent cases that HUD has brought other wealthy white communities. HUD's getting serious about enforcing fair housing policies. Um, he looked at the town itself and he uncovered a history in this town of Smithtown of racial exclusion. He looked at how actually it has a lot less affordable housing than other suburbs just like it. Um, the writing's on the wall, let this happen, Smithtown, or else you're in trouble, and HUD's gonna come after you. Uh, so the next, the next uh, uh, presentation is from the developer to potential buyers, right? Uh, so here he's got a brochure, and of course, <laughs> this doesn't look very GSD with, with the drop shadows and the argyle. <laughs> but we worked very hard, actually, to identify a style that we thought the potential buyers into this development would like. So it started out very slick and GSD-like, and we sort of said, how about some argyle, you know, some drop shots? Anyway. Um, <laughs> So I'm not gonna go through it in detail. It's a really nice project, a very thoughtful project, and this is a glossy brochure, right? It shows the kind of site plan, it shows the amenity mix, the standard floor plans. It sells this in terms of this is near you know, dining, and it's near health clinics, and so on and so forth. 
uh, and the unit price and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of takeaways here. Uh, one of the reasons I think this project is so brilliant is because it, it positions the designer as someone who can bring things together. Uh, the urban designer isn't just a form maker. He is innovating in policy, politics, finance. Uh, I also appreciate that he made deliverables that were suitable to the project, in this case, brochures, presentations that he left with the client. Um, I also appreciate the, the decision to uh, you know, change the style of the project to suit the audience and make representations that are likely to resonate with that audience. And of course, this was his project. This is not my project. My, he scoped it. He decided to do it. Um, just to put my cards on the table, I, would, I think this is how we should be training uh, our designers. This is the kind of interdisciplinary thinking uh, that we need if we're going to start chipping away at structural racism. What was my role here? Introducing him to Elaine, you know, uh, giving the students the opportunity to chip away at, race, at structural racism. The point being um, is that we, this is what we need to do, I think, give our students the opportunity to do this. Uh, the more we let them do this, the better the solutions are. These are solutions that I never would have had. So I'm not going to talk about my studio this semester, but I'm giving my students the opportunity to do this again this semester. We're looking at streets named after Martin Luther King. Uh, King is super popular. Uh, there are 900 streets named after him, right? Uh, and a lot of them don't necessarily reflect the legacy of King. Um, and so we're looking at how might you make uh, streets that better reflect the legacy of King. Uh, so, you know, you can see some of them across the country. We're looking at D.C. and St. Louis. Uh, Eric Shaw, who I think is here, is one of our clients at the Office of City Planning. Uh, same deal. We're, we're basically out with the students all the time, talking to people, trying to make connections, and giving the, the students the opportunities to come up with the solutions. They're better solutions than I could ever have. So let, let's give the students a chance, basically, is what I'm saying. Thanks. So, um, well, I stand before you with immense humility, um, thinking about all the awesome and important work that's just been presented and will be presented after me. So I'm going to be really short. I almost feel fraudulent being up here. I think I was asked to talk about the more official pedagogy as chair of the Department of Planning and Design. And, and I don't have slides, so I'm really fraudulent here in a, in a planning and design school. Um, the organizers asked me to talk a little bit about, um, actually, they wanted me to talk about the ways that I incorporate issues of diversity, racial and spatial justice, and other related themes into my own work and on my own work and my own research. I'm going to try to do that and I'll end with some comments about myself, but I did think it was important to start first by discussing the, these issues from the lens of the urban planning design department. So I'll be saying a little, just a few words about pedagogy in theory, not in practice. Some of the rest of the presentations are pedagogy in practice. Um, and, and I really hope what I'm saying is not going to be too unbelievably trite. It's something that we probably all know, but it's worth repeating because this um, conference just attests to the energy and enthusiasm and leadership of the students, many from planning and design, but also from architecture and landscape, that really is emerging up from the, from the trenches of the school students here. And I think the least that we can do as the administrators of the department is to respond to their work in meaningful ways and try to do what we can to kind of move it to the next step. So what I wanted to say about uh, the um, what we're trying to do in urban planning and design is really recognize the fact that this is a multifaceted endeavor that involves integrating into the curriculum whenever possible questions of race space, justice, exclusion, we can, the list goes on and on. 
In theory, this may be happening more in the urban planning program than in the urban design program, although that is a, a, a statement in theory, and there are plenty of classes being offered in urban planning that are not stepping up to the plate in the ways that they should. And I'm sure that also in urban design, there's more movement towards these questions. But I think that what we need a little more in our department and, and in the school as a whole is a more constructive and even can be combative dialogue across these programs about methodology, about concepts, and about assumptions, and whether the, the concepts, methods, and assumptions used in the disciplines and the different sub-disciplines -discipline, are enabling or constraining attention to diversity. Sometimes I fear that we are too readily ghettoized into two camps. Those who have social concerns versus those with design concerns, or those focused on process versus those focused on product, or those with ethical priorities and those with aesthetic priorities and other antimonies. And I think we just have to constantly be struggling to break down those polarizations, those dichotomizations, not just uh, in, in conversations, but in every project that we do, every curriculum that course that gets offered, we have to have that critical interrogation of those kind of dichotomies. Uh, I think that some, and as we've just seen from Dan's work, that so, some of this can be more easily accomplished um, by the framing of a subject or a topic that you throw different disciplines at. And that often happens in a, an options studio, maybe more readily than in the core curriculum. And this is something we we're, have been talking about this, this uh, weekend with the um, visiting committee. But I do think that the issue of thinking critically about what subjects can, can most draw the variety of spatial, racial justice issues onto the table in a more organic way is what we need to be thinking. We shouldn't be thinking about the skills that need to be offered. Let's think about uh, complex and controversial topics and subjects that those skills are used to disaggregate. Um, of course, ensuring diversity in the faculty and student body is absolutely central to all these, you know, advances and aims, but that's all really obvious and not original, and everyone here knows this, so I'm not gonna say anything else about that. So what I'd like to do now is just spend my last like three minutes or something to say, uh, to answer the first question about myself um, and how I try to integrate these issues into my own scholarly and professional life. So I guess first and foremost, it'd be, I would like to, and I hope this isn't too personal, but I don't have a lot else to share, so I'm gonna share myself with you. Um, that my own consciousness and knowledge was sparked by my own history and background as a student of urban sociology, as well as my love of cities. I grew up in a suburb of St. Louis, but learned early on that cities were different than suburbs, because I was fortunate to have a mother that would take me to downtown St. Louis all the time to old bookstores and areas of the city that people in the white suburb I grew up in never ever ventured into. Nobody went to downtown St. Louis when I was growing up. I grew up in a western suburb. And I learned that if I had a choice, I clearly wanted to live in a city. Um, and that's, in fact, why I chose to go to college in Chicago. Because that city literally took my breath away every time I drove through it during my family holidays, because my grandparents lived in Milwaukee and I lived in St. Louis, and we drove our station wagon from St. Louis to Milwaukee, and you would just come up on the city on Lakeshore Drive. Uh, and I still get chills when I think about the built environment and the skyscrapers and the landscape of a city like Chicago. And of course, we went into the city too. And then I went to college in Chicago, and I, at that moment, I knew I never wanted to live anywhere but a diverse, thriving city with a lot of difference. Later, when I studied urban sociology at Northwestern, I learned about theories of cosmopolitanism among other sociological frameworks to understand the urban experience and other theories that underscored the power, connection, and even social satisfaction that comes from living within diversity and through connectivity. Of course, I read some of the other authors who've been noted today, I mean, we really sit on the same page, Amber, about thinking about thinking sociologically and not just culturally about cities. 
but also um, Chicago, the, the home of the Chicago School of Sociology and Urban Sociology, when I was studying, I learned to think about physical space in a very different way. And I realized that social relationships were both products and producers of physical spaces and vice versa, for both good and for bad. And I do remember one assignment in an urban sociology class where I rode my bike to a black neighborhood in Evanston, Illinois, in order to complete a paper about the community, a big concept in urban sociology. We've studied it from so many different dimensions. And in the process, discovered how spatially isolated the neighborhood was. I had no idea before I got on my bike. Uh, cut off by train tracks, no grid, difficult to diverse, environmentally unstable conditions everywhere. So in short, at that moment, it was clear to me that the spatial context of social life was something that I'd never really thought about because I had, I guess to quote what Michael was saying, that I had thought about spaces through the white spatial imaginary all the time. It was, those were the spaces I knew and I didn't know how to see or read or experience other spaces. And thinking about um, the social and spatial imaginary has become a part of my own work. Um, as some of you might know, I don't work on American cities. I'm a specialist of urbanism and urbanization in the global south, particularly Latin America. But the same set of analytics continue to mark my thinking. In Latin American cities, the history of spatial exclusion is as powerful as and related to social exclusion as it is here, if not more. It also, well, I'm, I'm gonna take, come back on that, not, not more. Uh, it also is directly related to planning practice. Uh, because planning practice, practices, particularly modernist planning practices, have reinforced social spatial exclusion in ways that fuels a multiplicity of problems for the cities that I, I study. Uh, and for the cities as a whole, and not just the people who live in those excluded neighborhoods. Um, so I've made some arguments, some of you have heard about the ways that modernist planning is connected to social spatial exclusion, which in turn is connected directly to violence. Um, now, be, to be sure, in Latin American cities, the most excluded are defined by class and ethnicity, and slightly less so race, depending on which country you're in. Brazil is different than Mexico. I work mostly in Mexico. But the same principles of thinking about the ways that spatial conditions enable or constrain justice and inclusion are just as relevant in American cities as they are in cities I study in the rest of the world. And so I'll just have a little like promo or side comment here that now in full circle, Michael was mentioning earlier, I'm coming back with the same lens that I've been using to look at Latin American cities and violence and looking at St. Louis, Missouri, where I grew up, where, that started me on this journey. And we, I'm, so many people in this room are gonna be helping with that conference that we're having here March 30th and 31st. And we're going to be thinking about the way that the history of violence going back to the Civil War. So violence on the national scale, violence on the local scale are all interconnected in the production of space that reproduces more fragmentation, exclusion, and violence. Um, and I'm extremely excited about that project. And I think I'm coasting on the energy that the black and design organizers have already started to hear at the GSD to move forward to spring. Um, I think it's gonna be an amazing year for us here at the GSD. So to close, let me just say that I wanna loop back in terms of pedagogy to the sensibility that urban sociology cultivated in me as being absolutely critical, informing and reinforcing my views as well as my definition of the pedagogic aims of a design school like ours. I know it's not common for design schools to showcase sociological thinking or have faculty with a background in sociology, but I firmly believe that the student, all students here, should be exposed to the classical theories and methods of urban sociology, and that a sociological imagination and consciousness should be more emphasized and better articulated in our curriculum you have it already in your, in your classes, Amber, and we have to do a better job here, not just in planning design, but landscape as well as in the architecture program. 
For me, a sociological imagination forces us to think about the experiential connection between people and the built environment, as well as people and the urban experience more generally. And this is the very first step in thinking about how people can live together under and under what conditions and with what ethical or justice needs met or ignored. And I'm hoping to be able to advance these pedagogic aims more conscientiously here at the GSD in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, I would also like to thank the organizers. Um, you've done an incredible job. You know, I was contacted, I believe, very early on in the organization, and I was just observing um, with great awe. You know, the way you were doing everything, the way you were handling everything, and you know, really tirelessly keeping people on track um, for for these one and a half days um, that we are into now and that we still have ahead. So I would like to say that I'm also greatly humbled and following uh, Diane here to be part of this conference. I'm incredibly, I consider myself incredibly lucky, of course, also, um, but really very humbled, um, especially because my formal training was not in African American studies or American studies or American history for gen in general, for that matter. I should probably also mention in this context that um, I'm not American. Um, <laughs> and uh, even, you know, my, my, my country that I'm from, so uh, Germany uh, has, has its own uh, challenges at the moment, which are probably actually not that dissimilar in many respects. Um, but regardless, I am a landscape historian interested in the politics of design and space and also identity politics, besides many other things. And so it is in this capacity that I will present to you some of my concerns with regards to the pedagogy of the field. And I should also mention at this point that I'm going to talk a little bit more about content, which might be, um, you know, familiar to some of you, but um, I consider as, as a historian, as a scholar, um, not sufficiently studied yet, and I will come uh, back to that point um, a little further along in my presentation. Um, so landscape architecture is a very relatively young field. Um, the, the first professional organizations were founded in the late 19th century. It's also a field that is very fuzzy, uh, but it's in all its fuzziness, um, it is social, it is political, and it is cultural, amongst many other things. So as a result of all this, its historiography is young as well, even if the first historiographic accounts, often part mythical and part factual, go back to the 18th century. And I consider landscape history at the moment to stand at a crossroads at, um, where we have to look backwards but also forwards, learning from earlier historiography that within its limitations, of course, was on occasion surprisingly inclusive, for example, by way of integrating material history um, and the history of labor and technology. And what I'm showing you here is actually a page from John Claudius Loudon's uh, treatise uh, or encyclopedia of gardening from the early 19th century. And you see that material and labor, even looking back into history, is actually uh, dealt with already in the 19th century. But especially, um, of course, what becomes important in my field um, is also taking to heart the new perspectives and openings that critical theory has offered us in the last half century or so. In short, I would say landscape history needs to become more inclusive and pluralist. It needs additions, more research, new critical scholarship, and new perspectives. But it also needs revisions. Revisions to include not only, for example, the histories of women in the profession, but also the lives of African American women, at men who shaped, designed, built, and used designed landscapes. Um, and 
for whom designed landscapes could mean segregation and discrimination, but also empowerment and emancipation, as we heard um, uh, before as well. In particular, I believe we need inclusive and integrated histories that focus on the relationships between people of different ethnicities and races and the relationships between them and the landscapes they created and inhabited. And I believe that, in cer that it certainly makes sense to teach courses that look at landscape history through the lens of African American studies or black studies. And I've, we've, we've heard some beautiful, um, about some beautiful examples um, that may or may not, however, be uh, focused maybe more around the actual built artifact and um, uh, you know, constructed uh, buildings rather than uh, the open space. But um, but what happens in the big survey classes is really a, a question that I want to address um, here. So it is here where we really need to provide an overview, and this overview has to include matters of race. As it stands at the moment, though, what can be and is included is based upon extensive and often primary research by the respective lecturer, as only few landscape histories have addressed race more explicitly. I should mention some of them at least here. There are others, of course, also, but Diane Harris, um, a landscape historian historian, cultural geographer Richard Chine, and um, environmental designer Richard Westmacott are some of the authors who have um, dealt with the subject matter and have you know, started to lead the way. By focusing on or including race, it becomes clear that aspects of labor, social, and political history need to move to the foreground. Many dominant narratives can be revised and diversified in this process. So, for example, while formal histories of antebellum gardens in the Deep South would focus on the elaborate boxwood knot gardens modeled on patterns and similar practices in European gardens of the 16th and 17th centuries, looking at the larger context of the plantation home, of course, shows how the power relationships between the planter and his slaves are revealed in the spatial distribution of slave quarters and how the slave quarters and their labor are hidden and camouflaged by um, vegetation, so the uh, slave quarters here in the back, and then um, the kind of almost literal hiding, of course, also of, of these same constructions. So spatial segregation affecting African Americans and the use of made of landscape design and vegetation for this purpose becomes even more unobtrusive in another period and context. Parks were used in early 20th century southern cities like Atlanta to segregate, but also to conceal racial segregation. Parks were built as spatial barriers between white and black neighborhoods to prevent African Americans from entering the white neighborhoods. Following Jim Crow laws, there were parks and park systems for the white and black parts of the population, like Frederick, Lug Fre Frederick Douglass Park in Louisville, Kentucky, that you see here. And summer camps divided by race and gender, as you can see in this case, um, of the Colored Girls Patriotic League of Louisville. When the Olmsted brothers were hired to draw up a park system plan for Birmingham, Alabama, they noted that 40% of the population were African American and that while they had not made any specific recommendations for what they called Negro parks, you see the marked area here, provisions for the recreation of Afri African Americans certainly should be made. But yet, you know, they were only limited to one paragraph. If the same facilities were used, for example, in this 1920s uh, golf course in Washington's East Potomac Park, they were open to African-American citizens only one afternoon per week. In the late 19th and well into the 20th century then, the use of pub urban public open space was largely divided by race. And in contrast to what some commentators argued in the 1920s, parks and public open space in, south, in, in the south and the north, east and west, were also a battleground between the races. So obviously this is a gross uh, overstatement that the author is making here when he um, published this photograph in 1920. 
So as scholars like Galen Krantz and Robin Bacon have pointed out, racial conflicts and tensions were not only caused by metropolitan park politics, but they were also often played out in the parks themselves. In Chicago, at the beginning of the 20th century, for example, white gangs terrorized African Americans who tried to use the baseball fields in Washington Park. In the sprawling metropolis of Los Angeles, racial tensions led to the segregation of many recreation grounds, including swimming pools, beaches, and parks until into the second half of the 20th century. In the national capital in the 1960s, Meridian Hill Park, an icon of neoclassical public urban park design in the United States that was planned as the northern portal to the city amongst embassies and big mansions, finally became the location of African-American rallies against urban renewal projects in the nearby African-American neighborhood of Shaw. Thus, landscape and its various forms has been contested ground, exclusionary space, but also space for protest and empowerment. So I would like to end this short presentation with a small vignette for my current book project. And for this purpose, I'm going to describe to you briefly the content of a children's story entitled, What Are We Going to Do, Michael? Written, and it was written in the 1970s by Nellie Borchardt. So in this story, 10-year-old Michael, whom you see here sitting on the stoop, together with his adult friend, Mrs. Jacobson, helps to save an 80-year-old southern magnolia tree that is threatened to be cut down to make way for an urban renewal project in the neighborhood. Nellie Borchardt's story is based upon true facts and events occurring in Brooklyn's Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood in the 1960s and early 1970s. Yet the way in which Borchardt per portrays her fictional young hero, Michael, and his friend, Mrs. Jacobson, belie parts of the true story. As you can see in the children's book, the two protagonists appear as white residents. They are also portrayed as residents of a rundown, racially diverse neighborhood. In reality, however, Mrs. Jacobson was Hattie Cawthon, an African-American woman in her 70s living on a deteriorating neighborhood block in Bedford-Stuyvesant. By 1970, Bedford-Stuyvesant had become the second largest African-American community in the United States, and as Harold Connolly wrote in 1977, a code word for America's unresolved urban and race problems. Regardless of whether Borchardt's choice to change the race of her protagonists had anything to do with the book's aspired sales numbers or readership, or with the more idealist educational and egalitarian aspirations to cultivate white children's empathy and awareness of nature in the city and of its ethnically and racially diverse citizenry, or in turn even with an unabashed racism, both the choice of the story itself as well as the changes made to its principal characters reflected the social concerns and anxieties of the time. But changing the race of the principal characters, while perhaps making the story more accessible to the anticipated majority of readers, also covered up one of the most important facts about it. By rallying for the protection of the Southern Magnolia, successfully saving it and the three historic brownstone buildings behind it, and by founding and running the neighborhood tree core for the planting and maintenance of neighborhood street trees, African-American citizens of Bedford-Stuyvesant turned trees into a means of empowerment and emancipation within the civil rights movement. While the planting, maintenance, and conservation of trees became a grassroots initiative of Bedford Stuyvesant's African American citizens to assert their rights to the city and to its spaces in general, the tree planting and conservation activities provided, in particular, the most vulnerable and powerless groups, women and children, with a way to make themselves heard and seen. Tree planting and plantings became their tool of community building as well as a civil right that could be used against ghettoization. So in the context of today's event, I do not have time to go into the further details of the story. They're also not important for the point that I want to make here. Although historiography can obviously not be compared to a children's story, I hope this small vignette about the story can help to show how important it is to write and tell inclusive histories. In contrast to Nellie Borchardt's artistic freedom and the pedagogical intents she may have had with her book, in the pedagogy of landscape history, we need to provide students with awareness and 
with the tools to ask critical questions so that, his, so that histories can be written that do not represent, misrep sorry, misrepresent the facts, but that are firmly grounded in factual knowledge and then offer appropriate analysis and interpretation and the opportunity for merging theory and um, history. So more inclusive histories can lead to new perspectives and ultimately also to uncovering new ground that we did not even know existed before. Thank you. OK. I stand between beer and dogs, so I'll try to speed it up. <laughs> Unless somehow we can bring the beer and dogs in, and then we can really talk. OK. Um, in 2011, I was named the director of the J. Max Bond Center. Uh, it took me a few minutes to get things set up. It was just me for the first year. Um, we had an official launch of the center in 2012. And I kind of renamed the center, the J. Max Bond Center on Design for the Just City. And in 2013, I created a class by the same title. So why did I do this? I did this because um, I was approaching the third decade of my career and uh, actually had a body of work to look back on, both in the academy and in practice. And I was becoming really reflective around the impact of my work, both as an architect, an urban designer, and an urban planner on these issues that I faced in every city that I worked in, from Chicago to uh, Harlem in New York, to Washington DC, to Newark, to um, Detroit, to Oakland, to Memphis. And I was really beginning to stretch my head, particularly around the time that we learned that uh, DC was no longer Chocolate City. Was the work I was doing having an impact on social justice, really? And I know uh, in our field, we are in the space of trends around our work. Uh, and we're now beginning to resurface this notion of social impact design and public interest design and designing for equity. And I just really was itching to know, was I really doing anything about those things in meaningful ways that was changing the trajectory of cities and the people who were living in them as it related to those injustices? So I'm going to try to briefly walk you through, and I'm going to speed up. So I have a video at the end that I'd love to show all of it to you. It's about five minutes, so we we'll see if I can get to it. Um, the course does a couple of things, um, and, and all the speakers before me have set up a lot of which I, I base the pedagogy of this class on, so I'll try not to be too redundant. But as Amber sort of said, critical thinking is essential. The students in the seminar, and there have been 45 over four semesters, uh, 45 students over the four semesters, five African Americans, one American Hispanic, um, 19 women, 26 men, and four openly gay students. Um, and so they're all coming with different perspectives, and I needed them from day one to really challenge their thinking and actually the conventional uh, education and teachings they were getting in school, uh, I needed them to develop an awareness of their own self-identity. And Michael sort of set up the notion of um, the white spatial imaginaries and how some folks don't have to think about their self-identity or self-identify in such different ways than perhaps I do as a black woman. There's my self-identity, right? Um, uh, Michael doesn't introduce himself and say, hi, I'm a white man. Right? Um, and, and I also needed students to develop a, a kind of cultural competency. I also I often get students, because the majority of my students are not students of color, um, but they're very interested in working in these contested spaces and often feel sometimes self-conscious about their agency in neighborhoods for which people don't look like them, in, a, in neighborhoods for which they are not used to the experiences and environments from which uh, they are looking so desperately to solve. And so the way of language and the way of confidence and the, and the ways of engaging these communities with a confidence vis-a-vis uh, -vis this cultural competency is something that was important for us to explore in the class. The students apply these learning objectives in three ways. Um, they have to divine, de define for themselves what is the just city. Yes, students, you're required to have a point of view and to articulate 
that point of view. Um, and I do this through a written format and a video format, and I hope I get to show you uh, two examples of those. Uh, they have to analyze the possible roots and consequences of urban development. And again, Amber has set up uh, some of those conditions in her, in her class, and Dan has spoken to him as well. And in the end, because uh, I, I was so fascinated around measuring my impact, we actually go on to develop a indicator measurement tool. I wanted to explore in the same way that we're developing indicators for sustainability and resiliency and happiness and livability and all these other things, could you develop a metric for justice, for urban to justice and design to impact on it? Um, so first we talk about, let's set the context for why we're all here, inclusion and architecture. My shameless plug is the Damex Bond Center just recently published this report called Inclusion and Architecture. And it is a compilation of statistics on inclusion and practice and the academy for African Americans and Latinos. And, and, and there's far less information on the status of Hispanics in this profession uh, than there is on African Americans. Um, but as you all may know, and these are 2012 statistics. Uh, in terms of licensed architects, there are about 105,000 in the US. There are 100 and, uh, there's 1,600, roughly 1,700 African American and 8,300 uh, Hispanic. Um, so that's kind of how I sit in this space. <laughs> Uh, last I checked, and I could be wrong, uh, I, I was a registered architect, and I never kept up my registration, but I believe there are less than 300 black women in the US that have been licensed to become architects. Um, here's where they practice, and, and we wanted to look at the cities where there was this uh, majority of African American architects, or, or higher percentages of them, and we took it over 20, um, relative to where there are the majority of black folks, and, and they're still kind of at the southern parts of the United States, and we go on and, and we publish a number of demographics like this in our report. Uh, let's look at the academy. There are about 44,000 students in the academy. Uh, we see where they are relative to um, historically black colleges, which you'll see is about 1,200. Uh, the remaining students uh, are in other schools around the country. And we also look at it relative to faculty. 154 black faculty of architecture in the country. Right, 463. So just helps us put some numbers around the things that we've been talking about, and that was the whole purpose of our report. Here I am again. <laughs> so the only thing that changes substantially from this photograph uh, during my Rome Studies program at the University of Notre Dame in the 80s um, is that there are significantly more women if we were to put the picture up today, even though the images of folks of color might not change that much. So hooray for girl power uh, and pushing through this uh, discipline. And I wanted to contrast that from my humble beginnings, uh, which is growing up on the south side of Chicago, where there, it is the exact flipped. Uh, if you squint, you can find uh, the two white and one Hispanic student that was in my class. But I grew up in the segregated Chicago, where all of my classmates all the way through high school were African American. So, you know, I'm having to reconcile in the way that I view the world through this very different upside down, lopsided experience in terms of spatial imaginary. So all of this has shaped how I have created this course. First thing we have to do is understand what is justice. Um, we go through a number of different uh, theories and, and literatures about breaking down the term of justice. I'm very much interested in students being very specific with their words and terminologies. And if you're going to throw out inclusion or equity or justice, you need to tell me what that means to you. So part of this class is developing a, a language and a vocabulary that is informed by um, all these different theories that many of my uh, co-speakers have spoken to. So are we talking about distributive justice, where we're talking about social fairness and the way we move things with uh, e equality or equity? Are we talking about procedural fair play? Did everyone get their fair shake? Uh, did everyone get to speak? Restorative, putting things back as they should be, 40 acres and a mule. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Retributive, uh, are we talking about revenge? And interactional, uh, the way in which we develop mutual respect and trust, and how our racially segregated 
Cities don't often facilitate the opportunity for us to build these respects and trusts because we don't spend time with one another, even though we think we might because of um, our internet connectivity, if you will. So the conditions of the, the unjust city, I won't go through these because I think Dan and, and Amber and others have referenced them so much, but we wanted to understand both the spatial injustices in the city, like th that are caused by abandonment, that are caused by blight, that are caused by racial segregation. These are racial segregation maps of Chicago, Detroit, Washington, DC. Blue is black population or African-American population. Uh, red is Caucasian. Uh, orange is Hispanic. And I dare you to find green, but there are dots for Asian segregation. And what's fascinating about Detroit, obviously, well, obviously to me and, and probably a few others in the room, is that that very straight horizontal line that you see in the middle map running east and west is the geopolitical boundary of the city, the famous eight mile. So there's this street that literally reinforces the spatial, spatial segregation of a city, right? It's not a fence, it's not a wall, it's a street. So while we think we live in, in cities that are growing in their inclusivity, wow, I spent 10, ten minutes already? Um, uh, we, we don't. Uh, we're still separated by class as defined by unemployment, poverty, and education. Um, and all these conditions uh, continue to create spaces of concentrated isolation and poverty that are spatialized but are growing populations of four generations since the middle 60s that have not integrated themselves into other parts of the city and other parts of its economy. I am also finding then in these cities that I am encountering from a social injustice perspective the same classes of people. And so while we want to talk about justice for all, I believe there's a least not to be benefited from talking about it a little bit more um, specifically. That's women, that's immigrants, that's children. Uh, that is growing uh, since the recession, uh, the reduction of the middle class and, and people whose levels of affordability have been cut in half in some cases. Um, so there's a different and broader scope of injustice perhaps to be discussed. And there is an injustice to be talked about around specific classes of people. And at the moment, um, black men seem to be in the... In the um, in the focus of how we're talking about uh, inclusivity and perception um, of, of people in space. Um, like others have spoken to, we go through a history of how urban policy has, in some cases, enabled these conditions that we're so desperately wanting to change. Um, and then we try to blend uh, a notion of spatial and social justice together to talk about a concept of urban justice, where, again, we pick apart the specificity of what equity really means. And I've had students say, you know, I just want equality. I'm like, do you really? <laughs> or do you want equity? Do you really? Or do you want, or, or, or which ones of these are just? When we begin to now break down uh, many more values around what justice might mean, and do you care who it's for? Um, so we look at um, scholars like David Harvey uh, and his concepts of, of social justice around seeking uh, uh, this cooperation and dealing with um, processes of resolving conflict and conflict claims. Um, we look at the distributive paradigms where justice is not just about the distribution of material goods, but it's also about non-material goods like rights, power, self-respect. Um, in Detroit, for example, we looked at that through our Detroit Future City work when we looked at the share in a city that's 82% African American with a pretty healthy share of black owned businesses. However, 15% of the revenues of those businesses are only going to African Americans. So there's an example of distributed, distributive justice. Um, our former colleague uh, Susan Feinstein here at the GSD wrote a great book called The Just City, where she was very interested in the democratic aspects of justice, uh, looking at the criteria of justice specifically, these democratic relationships. We're finding that playing out when we're talking about the power structures in cities like Ferguson. And then Iris Marion Young, who's looking at it from a, a lens of acceptance of difference, not the erasure of difference to try to make one normative something than the other, but how that gets really incorporated as we talk about justice. And so we're not talking about this ideal community, but we're talking about the ideal of social, uh, city life, where communities are somehow coming together, um, but not uh, devolving their difference 
but bringing differences together. I'm not gonna have time to finish. Um, one of the things that the students have to do um, as I talked about, you know, it was important for us to, through the class, talk about self-identity. And I think as Michael sets up this notion of spatial imaginaries, is to recognize that we all have different spatial imaginary lenses. And so I asked the students, how would you each define justice and prioritize elements of the just city based on how we self-identify by gender, by race, by ethnicity, by class, by religion, by whether you grew up in the suburbs or whether you grew up in the city. Um, we do this little exercise, which was quite controversial by saying how do our identities inform how we perceive others in the city. So you'll see on the far right, there are these just very normative types of people. And then there are all these perhaps perceptions we might overlay onto them. And so I'm asking the students to check their bias. And so they are to draw a line uh, around some of these questions. So which individual do you believe has the greatest privilege? So depending on who you are, you're gonna draw a line to a different person. Uh, which of these individuals you believe does not feel they receive fair recognition in society? Uh, which individuals do you believe most frequently self-identifies with their race or gender? Who do you believe doesn't? My time is up. But, you know, so they have to do this, and I want everyone to recognize that we all come in with these biases, but I now love this term spatial imaginaries. And we have to own up to those um, in order to, I think, embed a sincerity in the work and, and an authenticity and confidence if we're really meant to go in and dig deep and do this kind of work in contested cities and really remove injustice. So they have to create a manifesto, this is one of them. From these manifestos we're finding we're extracting a whole host of really rich values that students feel like they're trying to achieve in the just city, which goes beyond just equity. It's about tolerance, it's about inclusivity, it's about ownership. It's about beauty, it's about creative innovation. So I'm loving the, the rich kind of catalog of values that we're developing to describe this. They have to record um, um, secondary research around conditions that my colleagues have shown before, so how the city is racially organized, um, overlaying that onto poverty and showing that people of color tend to be uh, more marginalized. And then they create their measurement tool. Um, they build it around a series of critical injustices, injustices that they see. This is from a, a class um, that I did in Berkeley last fall. Um, they use different methodologies of collecting information, so they can use secondary research, they can use observational uh, surveys, but one of the things that was really critical for them was to actually do intercept surveys and going in and finding out ways that communities themselves could self-assess the ways in which uh, they were performing around these issues. They then develop a framework of indicators. Here the students had equitable opportunity, shared power and process, spaces that delight, people create the city. Uh, they then go in and really assign measurable evidence-based types of metrics that can again be subjective because you're obtaining them through survey or they can be very hard data. And the combination of those I think is what builds the richness for it. Uh, they assess a case study. I'm not gonna show you the case study. This is how a neighborhood in Oakland came out as unjust around those categories. So it's beginning to give me an evidence kind of based way of testing out and taking the temperature and benchmarking. The next step of this would be a studio where the students would then begin to, to problem solve around correcting one of those injustices. I can't show you the video. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much to all our speakers. It was really inspiring. And thanks, Stephanie, for cracking the whip, <laughs> the timer. We're going to take just 10 minutes. Um, and I'm going to go straight to questions and comments from the audience. Um, I hope you had time to pre prepare them. Um, who wants to begin? Um, I Eric see. in the back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Vaughn's going. So, so um, um, how do you translate this to?
planning directors and policy makers and mayors. So this is a great conversation to have, but you know, Tony, I know you've worked in a planning office before. Are these conversations that um, the, the system of development allows to happen, or how do you sort of insert this into the dialogue um, as we do planning for cities and as we sort of you know, create these policies? Well, well, real quick, I, well, what I would love to see as mayors and planning officials and others um, speak to wanting to address these issues of injustice and speak to an inclusive city and an equitable city is to test that out. Um, and one of the reasons why I developed the course is because my larger ambition is to actually to develop a tool that you, Eric, would use uh, to benchmark the, the value-based performance of your city around a series of values for which you believe are important to you. So my 10 might not be your 10. Um, and to really begin to ascribe the performance of your city around a set of values and then ascribe a set of solutions around those same values. So I would love to work with you maybe as a pilot project to develop these at the citywide scale. I have an addition to that. Um, when I was in the School of Architecture, I actually told my students, uh, this is a confession, <laughs> Not all y'all have to be architects. And I hope that some of y'all do become politicians and sit in the planning office and so on and so forth and bring these skills to these areas. You don't, you don't have to be architect. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I want to add and then just to complicate matters a little. So, I mean, I agree with everything that said, I teach a class here on po politics of governance and implementation. So, and, and every example, Eric, I don't know you, but I hope to know you soon. Uh, we can just pick yeah. on them. Go for um, it. <laughs> I mean, I think that the, a large, just to complicate matters, a lot of the problems we're talking about exclusion, and well taken, the point about well, how do we define exclusion, exclusion is a consequence of the political structures and territorial structures of American cities. St. Louis, one of, the, one of the many problems in St. Louis is it's totally fragmented. Mm -hmm. There are so many municipalities. And so even if you could get your local mayor to listen to your claims and even do the metrics about value-based, there's a larger context in which all those problems are being focused in one place. So I guess I would say that there have to be a couple conversations at, at a couple different scales going out at the same time. And one thing that's, I think, amazing about this collection of people, what we collect at the GSD, is work across multiple scales all the time. And maybe that's also something we can cultivate a little more. Who do you talk to when you're doing a building as opposed to a neighborhood, and when you ta want to talk about um, redistributive injustice problems at the larger scale of the municipality, the metro area? Those are all open questions. My, my, my question is, first of all, I thank you for uh, whoever pulled this conference together is really exciting. Uh, my question, uh, questions or comments, um, excuse me, uh, regard the, um, the idea of, you know, all politics are local, all design is local. So my question is, you know, and during the, the 70s and the 60s, we had this thing called urban renewal where designers were trained in the pedagogy of the times to do design in a certain way, and we saw the results of that. And I, I want to know, you know, how are, are the things that you are sort of studying and practicing, how is that translating to the architecture schools? Because my experience in evaluating architects is that the design is horrible for a lot of architects. I hate to say that, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> you know, when we look at actual product, you know, it ignores fairness. Let's forget about, you know, I'm not going to say let's forget about racial fairness, but just human fairness on so many scales. And, you know, I think the design schools need to reintroduce a lot of the issues we have as um, African Americans in this country have to do with things that affect not just us, 
but people across many sectors. And I heard a lot of examples about black, black neighborhoods, but what about those cities that were primarily African-American cities? Has anyone gone in and studied what were the spatial relationships they had that maybe informed those communities? And how can we look at that and sort of see how that can sort of inform, you know, what we're doing on a larger city scale in other places? Just a comment. <laughs> I would recommend the work of Sarah Zudi, who I know is in here. I see her. Oh, you're, you're embarrassed now. Because um, she has done, her master's thesis was on something just like that, looking at black urbanisms in New Orleans and Brazil, uh, and how that can translate out. So she, she'll speak on that, hopefully, tomorrow. Craig Wilkins, come. Um, Craig Barton, will he be here tomorrow? So, will Barton be here tomorrow? I don't know. Okay, sorry. Hi. Um, hi, right here. Um, my question is, is uh, trying to connect the, the basic makeup of the panel uh, discussion about pedagogy um, and how to get these ideas into uh, architecture schools. Um, but relating that to the slide that Tony showed about um, 164 um, African American um, African Americans in on faculties. You add it ten. Or maybe 150. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> maybe those are the 10 that, that popped up over the last three years. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and fair, so, fair enough. <laughs> you know, so, so how, do we get, how do we get to a point where we have these types of ideas um, in the schools um, where there's 150 something uh, faculty members in 150 schools? Um, uh, and, and, and how can th those of us who are the single representatives of our schools um, not have to feel the burden to deliver that content ourselves? I mean, Amber kind of jokingly said, not all of you are going to be architects, but I, I think that should be an intentional kind of decision that you're not necessarily going to practice through your career as a traditional architect. So I started my career as a traditional architect and morphed into something I never would have. Imagine, and I'm, I, there are likely a number of other professionals in the room that have done the same. And, and I, why I think that's important to consider is because the issues that we have all talked about are larger, and, and actually Dan spoke to this, large, complex, interrelated issues that require your agency in a number of different sectors. And you should seriously consider throughout your career the moments where you potentially need to change your station to move your agency forward. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of skill you're developing in problem solving that allows you to think complexly as a number of these projects that we've presented have represented. And the way in which you can situate yourself at decision-making tables to further that, I strongly recommend. So to begin considering you know, that I'm going to teach at some point, which I made a conscious decision to do in my late 30s, that I wanted to integrate teaching and practice. Begin thinking about the multiple ways that you can use these skills that you're learning and the way in which you can shape the built environment from a number of different stations throughout your whole career, that you don't have to do just one thing. We have one more, one more question for um, tonight, yeah. I've been observing the huge amount of wealth creation happening in Silicon Valley um, and how there's so much exclusion just in that microzone. And when you look, look at the scale, it's just tremendous. How can some of the ideas you've, you've been talking about be used in that industry, you think? <laughs> Anything about the, the, the problem? Can you say a little more? Uh, I've been in the venture capital industry for the last two years, um, and I've been observing how um, there's so many biases built into it. Uh, who gets to get funded? Who's funding? Um, and I'm not sure if it has anything to do with uh, the, 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 the built environment, but I've been curious about everything you've talked about in terms of frameworks. And the frameworks you're talking about are, are, are just so different 
than when I hear about inclusive frameworks in Silicon Valley. So I just, have you ever probed that? Apparently not, so sorry about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 don't have, I don't have a really specific answer for you, but it's ironic you mentioned that because there's actually a little docudrama on, not a docudrama, I'm sorry, like a, a mini documentary on HBO right now called San Francisco 2.0. And it's speaking in some ways about the boom of Silicon Valley and the way in which it has shifted some of the spatial and social dynamics of San Francisco, you know, and, and why that sector is starting to move into the city and why it's pushing out. At first, you know, it was staying out and creating these colonies out there, which was doing a lot of the same things that Diane said, was that you have all these municipalities, and so this is not a singular city city, it's a regional problem, right? And what was happening is they were creating their own bus systems to move their employees who wanted to live in the city to work. So it was like this whole new economy of a, a transit system that was not a part of the public system. So you created this, this separation, right, of classes just by that infrastructure, so a distributive justice issue, perhaps. Um, but now, then the mayor changed policy and said, well, I want them here. So created, started creating incentives for those companies to move into the city. And now you're seeing, you know, a city where it's black population is somewhere between 6 and 3 percent, perhaps, in a very small part of the city, creating other kind of spatial challenges. So while I don't have a solution to it, I think it's a good example, and you might check out this documentary, because it, it's helpful to relate these, trend, these economic trends and the effects that they have on place and the policies of place. Can I Just, add on to that too? Um, thanks for, uh, well, that's, I, I was thinking about the same example, yeah. Tony, so that was amazing. Um, I guess I want to say that what I didn't, it makes me think, so this, the problem here is the corporate world. Silicon Valley, the venture capitalist, not you personally, but you know, the corporate <laughs> world. Because ultimately, it's like eating into not just the spatial, the spatial justice in the city, into the public sector. The pub, it's, it's like colonizing the public transportation system, other sets of things. What didn't come up in our panel, not that we could do everything, but hopefully will come up tomorrow or in more conversation, is a little bit about the public versus the private sector context of the work that happens. Mm -hmm. I know it's a huge question, much more so for architects. Most planners work for the public sector, although many do work for the private sector. But I do think when we start looking at the complexity of these issues, that we have to also understand how, do that, how does that division of those domains, what attention needs to be paid to the, those, that kind of axes when we're, when we're also understanding issues of, um, of injustice and inequity and lack of diversity in our disciplines. Actually, uh, an issue in, in Boston, um, are you from Boston? No. But here in Cambridge, we've got Area 4, which is a neighborhood nearby, and it's in Kendall Square, and there's been a lot of tech development, and there's been a lot of investment in the neighborhood, but it's clear that a lot of the residents from Area 4 and some of the housing projects around there are not benefiting in any way from some of the growth. So you can't assume that growth you know, uh, is good for everyone automatically. So I think that there's a role for us uh, as people who think about these issues is trying to make sure that to the extent that we have this kind of investment um, in our cities, and we should, that people who live in these neighborhoods where this investment is forming and becoming physical benefit, right, job, and that there's jo these things create jobs for people who live in, this, in these places, and that these places don't escalate proper property values to such an extent that people get displaced. So it is an issue. It's a while wow, for the gears to turn on that one, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's thank our speakers again, and then I'll ask Courtney to come up and... Uh, Where's Kurt? Oh, Courtney. sorry, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you all so much. Those were really amazing presentations. Really great to hear. Um, I think all very important um, insights for us to keep in mind, especially as we move forward as designers and continue to think about some of the conversations we're going to have um, during the course of this conference. Uh, so thank you all once again. Um, and uh, now we're going to start a workshop um, where we're going to talk about um, uh, what our responsibility is as designers and as non-designers, people who deal with the built environment every day um, towards um, 
addressing issues of social justice and race, as well as gender, class, sexuality, um, and all characteristics that can be attributed to someone and are used as forms of discrimination. So we wanna think about what are our responsibilities moving forward and what kind of pledges are we going to make to ourselves to continue to address these issues of social justice. So I'd like to invite Phil Freelon up. Thank you so much for joining us, Phil. If you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself. Well, uh, my name is Phil Freelon. I'm an architect, a practitioner, a teacher down the street at MIT, um, and also an advocate for what's going on here today. And I just want to congratulate the students for putting together a terrific uh, program. And let's give them a hand. It's been terrific. don't know, Phil Freelon is um, really someone who has paved the path for a lot of African American architects and designers in general in the field. Um, he is working on the Smithsonian Museum of African American Art as well as the, uh, the new uh, Studio Museum in Harlem. No. Oh, that's, sorry. That's David, oh, just the... <laughs> but, 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 but that's enough. Um, You'll hear more from me later uh, tomorrow, where, where we present some of our work and, and talk about it in the context of all that's going on today. But what I want to do, it's, it's an abbreviated workshop because we don't have a lot of time, right? And so uh, things have been lagging just a bit. So while we have you here, uh, the students have started a, a statement, a manifesto, if you will, which you can read parts of it here. And the idea is to get additional ideas as they try and flesh this out and turn this into a, a, a document that can be carried forward here at the GSD. And we have several groups that are uh, going to be providing facilitation. So if you need help at your table, uh, you're unclear about the topic or where we're headed, uh, these groups will help. First is the women in design. Can you raise your hand if you're part of that group, the women in design? So they will be rotating around to the tables. And uh, this is a forum to uh, integrate dialogue and action uh, uh, advancing gender inequity, and they've been set up here at the GSD, and so they're going to be part of the facilitation. There's also the working GSD. Where are those members? Okay, they are also going to help facilitate. This is a group that advocates for financial diversity and affordability here at the GSD. And uh, finally, our, our last facilitator is, is someone we all know, and I'm, I'm just tickled that he's here, uh, M. David Lee, FAIA NOMA. David, where are you? David is a principal with Stull and Lee here in Boston, where he directs a wide variety of architectural and urban design and planning projects. And uh, he's been an adjunct professor here, as well as MIT and the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, he has served on, on many juries and has just been a, a champion for um, architects of color and, and urban design. And so we're, we're delighted to have him here. He's a Chicago native, Southside, okay. Um, David earned his B. Arch from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, and then after working in Philadelphia for a time, he came to Boston and joined uh, Don Stahl's office, and now has been a leader there for, for many, many years. And so uh, I know it's late, but let's take 30 minutes if we can and focus on these scales of action. Uh, and you can read them for yourselves. And at each table, I think you're designated for one of those scales, and begin to think about the issues that are started in the manifesto and give the students more ideas and let's build on that so that at the end of this conference there's something powerful and meaningful that we can carry forward. And I'll be roaming around too and trying to help. And so we've got 30 more minutes. Sorry things are running late. And we can say each table has a facilitator. Each, each table has a facilitator so you'll, you'll get some direction from someone at your table. So let's get started. So thank you all for participating in the workshop. Um, we are going to take the notes that you all have gathered today um, and aggregate them into a manifesto, um, which uh, Women in Design and Working GSD are going to collaborate uh, with the ASU to prepare and release um, in an open letters document. Um, it's a bi-weekly publication that comes out um, at the GSD, and we will share it online with all of you. Um, and uh, before we move on to Beer and Dogs, um, which is a, a weekly tradition at the GSD, Catherine is going to introduce a brief presentation. 
Hi, everybody. I just would like to um, introduce our next speaker or um, kind of a person that's going to introduce a, a great opportunity for young designers. Um, so she asked for an opportunity to uh, present um, one of the fellowships that her organization um, is privileged to offer. And so Katie Swenson is the Vice President of Design for Enterprise Community, and she will present an opportunity um, for young designers to participate in. Thanks. Hi, um, thank you so much. What an absolute treat to be here. And um, I was really pleased. Uh, first, Jonathan Evans, who I knew at UVA, told me this conference was going on. And then I got an email from Catherine asking if we would help support the conference. And um, honestly, I've been so thrilled and impressed by all of these students and couldn't resist the opportunity both to support them and also to really talk about student leadership. Um, I work at Enterprise Community Partners. There are a couple, I understand, a couple of alumni here from Enterprise, um, people who got their start, now Loeb Fellows and et cetera. Um, Enterprise is a national community development and affordable housing intermediary. We have been lucky to um, sponsor a program called the Rose Fellowship, and we've had two GSD grads who um, I want to talk about tonight, who have been in our program. And I thought it was great, actually, to be right between pedagogy and practice tomorrow. Because our program sort of is filling this very important moment in a career path out of school. But when, um, and I would say to Dan, when issues of addressing race, place, power, and privilege through practice on the ground are so critically important. Um, Teresa was a member of SOCA at the GSD, for those of you who remember that. She got her MR here in 2007. SOCA was called Students of Color Association when she was first here, but at that time there were not enough students of color to make an association, and they changed the name to Social Change and Activism. By the time Laura got here, she got, her, um, she got her Master's of Urban Design in 2008. She actually says SOCA was continuing. Here's Laura. Um, and um, at that time, it was really a very interesting time to be at the GSD because the GSD was actively recruiting students of color. And she worked with Steve Lewis, and they planned a trip to South Africa. Um, so there was a lot of energy around um, sort of recruiting students of color at that time. So when I, I want to just talk a little bit about these two examples. Um, at Enterprise, you know, I would say the community development field as a whole, we heard a little bit about affordable housing. You heard about uh, like Dan's presentation. These are the kinds of projects that we work in practice on. So imagine the presentation that Dan made, only you're on the ground for three years trying to make that happen. But I would say in the community development field, we're very focused on affordable housing and affordable housing, you know, kind of what it means in terms of connecting to opportunity. But we desperately need a way more nuanced dialogue around the issues facing our communities. There is not enough discussion about race. There's not enough discussion about incarceration and all of these sort of patterns that, that are shaping our world. Um, so meanwhile, I would also say that happily, the question about whether good design and doing good is possible is like, it's done. We're roommates with Mass Design Group, one of, you sh one of your most proud moments, I would assume. We know that the world in which good design, doing good, is no longer a question. This is Via Verde in New York, a spectacular project that is incredibly dense and wonderful for its community. So there are a few things that are shifting, and I would say if you're a student looking to sort of make this next path, how do you kind of carry your identity and your particular focus into practice in communities? So for Teresa, when she left here, actually, she didn't think she wanted to be an architect. She worked with um, an Asian arts organization in Boston, and she thought, you know, architecture is not for me necessarily, right? And so she kind of went off the architecture path for a few years. The Rose Fellowship actually kind of allowed her 
to bring these fields back together. So she moved to LA. She was working with Skid Row Housing Trust. Um, here she's pictured with Michael Malton, who is the architect on her project. So she's really his boss in this scenario. Um, but she was the translator between the architect and the community needs and really understanding and developing a sort of methodology for understanding what the specific needs of community members are. So she not only is, has sort of re-engaged in architecture, but is also developing sort of her own personal version of this, which involves a highly sort of engaged community design process. And she's now opened um, a design center on Skid Row, and she's doing a, uh, a plan for Skid Row, uh, uh, basically a, a landscape and urban design plan. It's not just the buildings for all the people who don't even have a house to live in. So. Um, it allowed her to kind of integrate this. Laura worked in um, San Francisco. Here she's pictured with David Baker and Amit Price Patel, architects with whom she worked on um, this project, which um, someone was talking about NIMBYism earlier. This is um, affordable housing for chronically homeless right across in this city hall. And, you know, an, an, an exquisitely high level of design in, in each manner, but all targeted to these human outcomes, jobs, health, um, well-being, all of these um, very targeted sort of outcomes. So I wanted to just share with you a few examples of this. Um, I was so thrilled to hear from one of the Loeb Fellows who was an early enterpriser that coming to enterprise sort of allowed her to really spark a different kind of career path. And whether it's the Rose Fellowship or some other program, I think as you get out of school and merge out of school, there are a couple of things that this program and others really can allow you to do. And you know, the first thing is to give yourself some time and some space to figure out how your identity and your kind of personal perspective can play out in your professional life. And Tony referred to this. She, you know, she said that your voice is going to be needed in really difficult situations and that you might have to change the station. So allowing yourself to try different stations, to try things a little bit outside your, your comfort zone. The next thing I would say that the fellowship does, but it's not unique to the fellowship, is create this culture of mentorship. And you know, my guess is that you could call almost anyone in this room today if you're looking for advice or consult, and that you know you should be providing that kind of mentorship to others. And you know, the last thing I would just say is that the kinds of conversations that are happening in this room need to really influence our community development sphere much more broadly. We have focused. Uh, as you know, very much on sort of a sense about design and design quality and affordable housing, as you kind of see in some of these examples. But that's that conversation, the kind of conversation that was represented here tonight, has so much more opportunity to grow and deepen. So I really invite you all to join us. Thanks. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your participation this evening. And Katie, thank you so much for sharing the opportunity with us. Um, we would like to invite you all to join us for Beer and Dogs, which will be on the basketball court in the backyard. And for the food that will be provided, you'll use your blue tickets. And before you leave, also I want to let you know that tomorrow morning, there will be a yoga work workshop before the session really kicks off. Um, Wear your normal clothes. It's something you can do seated. And you can sign up for that. And we will meet you outside. Thank you so much. Oh. Oh, and we want to let you know that the food was being provided by Fresh Food Generation, which is a, um, a local food truck that is uh, based out of Dorchester. And it is run by Cassandra Campbell, who is a master of urban planning. And she'll be speaking tomorrow during the lunch planning, or during the lunch panel. Thank you.